Okay, so hi everyone. I will be your host today for the AI meeting. First of all, I would like to thank Barrett for accepting this uh, invitation and uh, coming to our AI seminar series. So uh, I will introduce Barrett to you and please, uh, if, if, uh, if I miss anything, please uh, just add them. So uh, Barrett is a senior research scientist on the Google Brain team. Uh, he, ha he has worked on um, like uh, especially uh, on the neural architecture search problems and he has uh, some previous work on transfer learning on uh, machine translation with Denis Oja, uh, which I am aware of. Um, uh, basically, he has a lot of work on uh, multidisciplinary, so uh, not a language guy or a vision guy, so there, there is no uh, just a, a neural search architecture. Um, uh, and, and today he will be talking about the switch transformer, uh, basically their paper and uh, the uh, b b bigger language model, uh, uh, the, which is uh, right now, I think the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, up to now, the, the biggest uh, language model ever, uh, but uh, he will explain why uh, is this feasible. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm uh, super excited to give the talk. And um, yeah, throughout the talk, if anyone has questions, feel free to interrupt, ask me stuff. I feel like it's very fun when it's really interactive. So yeah, um, great. OK, so let me just present my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Or I don't know. Oh, maybe I have to click share. Sorry, I don't use Zoom much just because I work at uh, Google. Okay. Here, let me see if this works. Is this good? Yeah, yeah. we can yes. see your screen. Right. Awesome. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about how to, you know, scale transformers through sparsity. And also as a part of this, I'm talking about switch transformer, but I also want to just kind of keep it um, a bit more general. And the kind of sparsity I'm talking about today is actually when um, each input can get a different set of weights and or have different um, computation applied to it. So, you know, if you have two tokens coming in, potentially each token could get a different subset of weights. They also might, like one might have more computation applied than the other. So yeah, this is the kind of sparsity I'm talking about today, and we're going to be using it in the context of how to scale up um, neural models today. So yeah, so let me first give like a little bit of background on the scale in neural language models. I mean, I know this is kind of really like all the rage these days, but I thought it could be a, um, a bit useful to just go into, into this a bit. So yeah, so... There was some really good work coming out of OpenAI in early 2020 on neural scaling laws. And the idea was that language modeling performance kind of follows this like power law curve over many orders of magnitude, which actually gives us like a lot of confidence that scaling models can really lead to good performance as we increase in, as we like, you know, continue to increase it, you know, beyond like the 2x, 10x, 100x, its current biggest size. And we can see that, you know, this, this skills actually like the scaling is very predictable, especially in terms of like the compute, the number of parameters, and also the data set size, as long as the model isn't bounded by any one of these three. And we can also see some other really nice properties is that actually larger models are, can be actually more sample efficient, which I think a lot of people thought was kind of counterintuitive at the time, where actually a larger model, even if you've, you have know, have less tokens than the number of parameters in the model, it can actually be more efficient to just train a large model as opposed to training a smaller one for many more steps. And this is very promising also just in terms of like the motivation of scaling with sparsity because you know we're going to be making the models not only larger through the number of flops each token processes but also just have significantly more parameters. So it's nice to know that you know for dense models which neural scaling laws looked at it didn't look at any sparse models. We know that you know scaling these things um, leads to these models being much more efficient on a step basis and also are a lot of the times Pareto optimal for a given amount of like hardware budget. So yeah, so now in this work, we're actually gonna be like studying scaling models on a new axis, which is sparsity. So scaling the sparsely used parameters with a fixed computation for example, it can, is independently useful. So that was kind of our idea of where, you know, we'll keep the same um, like floating point operations per token, but potentially each token can get different weights. And so now this is actually completely orthogonal to the scaling laws paper where they're actually, um, for each token, they're increasing the number of flops per token and also slightly the amount of parameters. And the way we're going to be going about this is through using um, mixture of experts. And you know, this was 
there's a lot of really good work done on these type of models in the in the 90s, especially by you know Jacobs and Jordan and Nolan and Hinton. And recently, these models were rebooted in the context of deep learning in 2017 by Shazir et al. at Google. And yeah, so we can see on the right like a like a you know a diagram of what this looks like. And yeah, the revamp of these models is actually extremely interesting because they're they're kind of really co-designed to work well um, with modern hardware. So it's kind of like, you know, given we have the hardware and the communication primitives we do, like how can we efficiently, you know, implement like a mixture of expert style model. And the way that this was done in 2017, and this was, you know, pre-transformer, so it was done on LSTMs. So we can see on the right, the MOE layer. And the way it works is actually pretty simple. So there'll be some token coming in X, which is just like some, you know, embedding representation. And there's some learned gating network, which is typically just like a dot product and then a softmax, which the idea being like, okay, I want to get like um, a probability for each of the experts from one to N. And the idea is that, you know, you send a token in, you give it to the gating network, and then it chooses, you know, one or more experts to send the token to. Um, and in this case, it's sending it to two. And then the idea is like, then the token is communicated to those two experts, computation is applied, you scale it by the, the router probability. At, so it allows the router probability, so it allows the router network to be trained. And then it's, you know, passed to the next layer. So it's overall like a pretty simple computation. And the idea is that, you know, roughly each expert size would be the size that you would normally have for your like, you know, feed forward layer. So you can see that like, you know, if you only send the token to a single expert, like actually the same computation is applied to each token. But now it's that, you know, each token can potentially get a different set of weights. And this makes a lot of sense in the context of these uh, deep learning models, especially where people are always training with data parallelism. If you're training with data parallelism, the idea is, you know, you have like N cores, you partition your data over n cores and you just replicate the model weights across all of your all of your cores but the idea with this is a little bit um interesting where it's like okay for most of the layers replicate all of your weights for every core but for the mixture of expert layers typically what we do is we have one um expert per data parallelism core so then the idea is that like yeah each of those cores will now get like a unique set of weights and when you do the gating network each token is communicated to the correct expert and then communicated back to its original core uh, yeah, Denise. Uh, hi, Barrett. So um, it, whenever we have some discrete decision inside a network uh, that, you know, poses a problem from uh, for gradient calculations. So how, how does this gating actually not um, cause a problem for backprop? Oh, yeah, great question. So, okay, so first we send the token to the gating network, which will just compute some dot products and softmax, right? So then we'll get a bunch of numbers. Like each token will get like um, N numbers for like one number for each expert. The idea is then we do like a top K operation or a top one operation and send it to those experts. So at this point, it's definitely not differentiable. The, I, the thing we do is a little bit of like this hack where we multiply the gating network probability for the expert computation that was applied at the output. So for expert two, we would multiply it by the router probability for expert two and for expert N, we'd multiply it by the um, router probability for expert N. And then you just send the token to the next layer. And this allows actually everything to be differentiable end to end and seems to actually work uh, pretty well in practice. So yeah, so we've actually already seen some really successful applications of MOE models also in um, transformers. There's some really nice work from the GShare team in 2020 of using these models for machine translation. And they also got, you know, pretty nice scaling properties as they scaled up the number of experts and were able to, you know, achieve really good performance over their, you know, dense model counterparts. But in general, like we, we haven't really seen these be used as much as we expected. And we thought that they were kind of hindered by three key things. Like one of which is the model complexity like implementing these things is actually really complex. There's a lot of like, you know, technical nuances and getting them to run well on modern hardware can be like pretty complicated. Also, there can be quite high communication costs. So the way that tokens are sent to each experts requires like sending tokens around to all of the different, you know, processors you have, which can be pretty expensive, especially as you route um, two or more tokens. And also we discovered that these models are just much more unstable than their dense counterparts. And when like I say a model is unstable, like typically the loss, the training loss would just diverge, you know, and weird dynamics like that. So we would definitely encounter a lot of issues with this. Um, and so our idea was to try to like, you know, just very simply like try to make progress on all of those three items that we thought were really like hindering the use of them because there just hasn't been as much widespread adoption as we would have anticipated. 
And so with this, we had the work switch transformer, which is like, you know, a lot of simplifications on MOE along with some improvements to make the models, you know, be more stable and um, fine tune better. And with this approach, we actually, yeah, at the time trained the largest model in terms of number of parameters, not in terms of flops per token, but yeah, the model had up to like 1.6 trillion parameters. Um, and also funnily enough, as I'll go into later, it actually wasn't the best performing model of all the, uh, of all the models we tried. So yes, definitely just having, you know, scaling through sparsity alone is definitely not enough to train the best language models in the world. Yeah, so here we can see an example of like how we kind of design our networks with these sparse layers, in this case, like a switch layer. So the idea is the following. So yeah, in Transformer, you typically have these like repeats of these four blocks, which is like self-attention, these like add and normalize, and then some feed forward layer, and then, you know, add and normalize again. And what we usually do is we replace one every two or four feed forward layers with one of these switch um, or like MOE layers. So we can see an illustration of this on the um, on the right. And so here we can see um, the self-attention and the added normalizer are exactly the same. And we have two tokens coming in. So these are just gonna be like two vectors going into the network. And the self-attention parameters and everything are shared. But when you go to the, um, the blue sparse layer, the idea is that instead of having just a single feed forward set of weights, we have four feed forward set of weights denoted by like FFN1, FFN2, FFN3, FFN4. And so, yeah, first we send the token to the router as in before, and then we only send it to the highest um, probability expert. So typically with mixture of experts, there was, I think this belief that, you know, you had to send it to at least two experts so it could have some kind of like counterfactual on like, how did it do compared to, you know, another token or something like that. But we actually found that, you know, sending it to just a single expert works quite well. And this actually has a lot of benefits um, technically that I'll go into later, including like, you know, reduced communication costs. But yeah, it's a very similar design to these mixture of expert layers, you know, where we'll send the token to the router, we send it to its highest um, probability expert, and then again, scale the expert output by the router probability to make it uh, differentiable. So we also, you know, looked at like a few improved um, training techniques for these models to allow them to, you know, yeah, be more stable and be able to fine tune better as well. So we kind of like focused on three different things. The first of which is this thing called selective precision. So when we were training these models, we really want to be able to train them in lower precision formats. This has a lot of benefits in terms of like the speed for computing a map mold to like sending tensors around smaller in size when doing communications for like data and model parallelism. So by default, we found that like these models were unstable to train in like these bfloat 16 precision format, which we use for TPUs. But, um, so we had to use float 32, but we actually found that like through casting some like subset of the model in actually uh, bfloat 16, it didn't really change the speed and we could basically just run most of the model then at bfloat 16. We also experimented and found it was really useful to change the initialization scale of these models and also to slightly adjust the learning rate schedule. Also, in addition, we you know, found that regularizing the expert layers helps the models to fine tune better as these models have significantly more parameters. And we did sometimes notice they were more prone to overfitting, especially on smaller fine tuning tasks. Um, and, and finally, we also like, talk about this differentiable load balancing technique we use, but we don't go too much into detail on that. Like at a high level, we want these models to be very efficient running on modern hardware accelerators. So we actually need to like make sure we're sending roughly the same amount of tokens to each expert. And to do this, we simply tack on an additional loss to the cross entropy loss that we're training the model with to encourage this behavior during um, pre-training. Yeah, so this is the selective precision um, topic I was talking about before. So the idea is that, yeah, we wanna be able to train our models with low, low like the lowest precision uh, possible. So yeah, basically what we've found is that in the softmax, the gating operation, like you really have to make these things float 32, um, which, which makes sense, I think. So yeah, like the way that these floating point numbers works, like there's can be these like round off errors. And if you're like, you know, have a round off error going into something that's an exponential function, this can be like really harmful. So like if you change a number by 0.1, a lot of the times if you're like multiplying two numbers together or adding two numbers together, this doesn't make a huge deal. But if you change a number by 0.1, that can that's already quite large going inside of an exponential, like this can vastly change 
the output of the number. And so, yeah, essentially like any place there's an exponential number in these kind of models, like you really have to be careful and or like make sure you're running at the highest position as possible. But yeah, essentially we found that the speed is exactly the same and the quality stays about the same as well. Yeah, so another thing we found is that these models um, definitely benefit from a reduced initialization scale. Um, yeah, so it's a very simple change and essentially it just makes the models like train much more stably. I think the kind of complex dynamics when you start training these models from the standpoint of like, you know, in the beginning, the random is the, the routing is completely random and the model doesn't really know what to do, which makes like the initial like 10 to 20,000 steps of training much more unstable. So having a reduced initialization scale and also using like a very gradual learning rate warm up really help these models to be able to train better. Yeah, and lastly, we were experimenting with some new fine tuning procedures. And yeah, we found that like, you know, across these four different fine tuning tasks, which is like glue, C, CNN, DM, squad, and super glue, that by applying like very high dropout rates in the internals of the experts, this, this really was helpful in preventing overfitting. And we found that the sparse models were able to, you know, fine tune much better because of this, which I think makes sense. Like, I think, you know, having a lot of parameters definitely can make the model much more prone to overfitting, especially when we're, you know, fine tuning models with hundreds of billions to trillions of parameters on tasks where there's only, you know, 50,000 examples or something like that. Yeah, and then finally, this was the load balancing loss. So yeah, again, so when we're training these models, we will want roughly each expert to have the same amount of tokens getting sent to it. And the simplest way we found to make this work is just by adding an auxiliary load balancing loss. So yeah, the load balancing loss, we actually experimented with a few different formulations and the model really wasn't sensitive to it. Like you can basically add on a lot of different losses, like anything like you can really think of that can kind of encourage the model to load balance. Like it, it kind of worked, um, which is nice. It was very easy to get the model to both like improve the cross entropy loss and to also make sure that the model was load balanced. 10 to 20,000 steps into pre-training. And so, yeah, like I said before, especially given that we're using TPUs, like we need to be using static shapes for all of our tensors. But, you know, switch transformer and these sparse layers are very dynamic since it routes tokens on the fly and we don't know necessarily ahead of time how many tokens will be going to each expert per batch. And so we have we have this interesting hyperparameter which we call the um, capacity factor which donates, which, which um, you know, figures out what the expert batch size should be ahead of time. And the way it works is as follows. It's very simple. So let's say you have like six tokens and you have three experts. By default, this would leave two slots for each expert. And we call it, we have that be a capacity factor of one. And yeah, so, but we can see here, like the problem is that if you have six tokens and three actually wanna to go to device zero, this is really bad. So since we have to have static shapes ahead of time, we won't be able to apply any computation to that token. So then we simply just like, you know, add its information through a residual connection or on the layer. But yeah, no computation on the experts can be applied to it. And this also means that expert three will have one extra spot where, where nothing's being used for it, which also seems bad. So one solution we kind of had for this was by increasing the capacity factor. So with a with a ratio of 1.5, that means that you know we'll have extra buffer in each of the experts. So that you know, in case more tokens get sent to one expert, we can like kind of roughly account for this. But the problem is then, you know, in general, more computation is applied and there's also extra communication across devices. So yeah, there's definitely some trade-offs with this, um, which we go into later and just like empirically study like how important is token dropping or not? Like, is it really catastrophic if sometimes the model doesn't apply computation to all these tokens versus like, is it worth having the additional like increased training time to allow to make sure all tokens can always be processed? And at a high level, we actually find the model is pretty robust to dropping tokens, which is very surprising, both during pre-training and fine tuning, where, yeah, it, it's still, this is, I would say a big open question of like how the model is really able to do something like this, where you give it a sentence, and you know you drop some tokens versus not drop some tokens, and it can still have you know roughly similar performance. So yeah, the model has definitely learned to be able to have like stochastic computation going on inside the network, and can be actually pretty robust to these changes, as I'll um, go into a bit later. 
So one obvious solution to this problem I was going back into before where we see these like white slots where no computation is being applied to it, where you know also then some tokens are actually being dropped is to simply have a multiple, like multiple stages of routing where the idea is like, okay, so in stage one, we do what I was talking about before where we route tokens to their highest probability expert. And if there's any tokens overflowing, then in the next stage, send them to their second highest probability expert, so forth, so on. And this can just allow you to guarantee that there's no token dropping beyond some level, depending on how many stages you go through. Um, but yeah, this this was a very like, you know, we thought this was definitely be very helpful, but it actually ended up hurting the model performance, which we found very interesting. And yeah, I think the intuition is, is the following, that the model is learning to send tokens to specific experts, and it really wants to have that computation applied to the token. Sending it to some other like computation from another expert, it doesn't really, you know, get like do the same thing that the model wants. And because of it, it even like harms the performance as opposed to like just having um, no computation applied to it. So yeah, so to put together all of these improvements, yeah, we, we're basically proposed the switch transformer layer, which just selects only one token, uh, one expert per token, and then also incorporates some general sparse models improvements to allow them to train at lower precision, like some reduced initialization scales and some changes to the learning rate schedule, higher expert regularization during fine tuning. And we also look at the um, parallelism strategies here. And we actually do like this new kind of three-dimensional partitioning that allows us to do model parallelism also with experts and data parallelism. So this was kind of our best solution we found in the end and actually allows us to get our like highest performing results with a mixture of experts. So one thing we actually wanted to look at too was like comparing the top one routing versus the top uh, two routing. And we actually wanted to compare it across a bunch of different capacity factors. So here we can actually just see we have two dense models, T5 base and T5 large. So the idea with T5 large is I think it's roughly three times to four times as large as T5 base. And we look at the, the pre-training complexity um, after like 100,000 steps and also the time it took to achieve some performance um, based on like the, the amount of hardware we give it. So all these models, we give like a certain amount of cores and then we just see like how many hours it takes to get some performance. And we also report the speed um, like of the, the examples per second in the final right column. So now we compare the top one routing switch versus mixture of expert routing. And so this is with a capacity factor of two. So again, this means that essentially each expert will have room for two tokens. So in this regime, we definitely see that the mixture of expert model outperforms the top one um, routing model which makes total sense because you know it's really being able to take advantage of sending more than one token to an expert. So we can see that you know the speeds are roughly equivalent for top one and top two in this scenario, but the performance of the mixture of expert model is definitely better. Moving down, we actually reduce the capacity factor. So this is actually where it becomes very interesting because when you reduce the capacity factor, not only does it reduce compute proportional to that, it also reduces communication and memory proportional to that. So going from a capacity factor to two to a capacity factor of 1.0, it basically like halves the memory, it halves the compute, and it halves a lot of the communication costs. So it's a very important parameter. And yeah, the more you can reduce it is extremely beneficial. So we can see at 1.25 that the switch model starts doing you know, a decent amount better than the MOE model. And this is pretty exciting because also in terms of the time to reach the perplexity, we can see that the switch model is also much better. So kind of for a fixed amount of hardware, the Pareto optimal thing for getting good performance with these models is definitely to be using a reduced capacity factor and just sending you know a token to only like a single expert. And again, we can reduce the capacity factor even more to 1.0 and we see again, the same trend. And actually across all the models we've tried here, yeah, the Pareto optimal thing for the given amount of hardware we had was yeah, to just train a top one switch model with a capacity factor 1.0 as it's you know, the quickest to achieve the quality threshold we set. So yeah, like as we've seen in the prior scaling law work, we also really wanted to study the scaling properties of these models because now we have like a few axes to scale our model. The first of which is we could scale it the kind of standard way by increasing model dimensions, which scales both the flops and the number of parameters versus sparsity where we keep flops the same 
and just scale the number of parameters through through increasing um, the number of experts. But we get you know a huge increase in the number of parameters through scaling experts. While as when you're scaling a dense model, like you actually you know get slower parameter scaling. So yeah, so first we wanted to look at like on a step basis, like how do these sparse models scale as we go from like 16 experts to 32 to 64 to 128, and we can definitely see that you know you do get somewhat diminishing returns at some level. So yeah, so going from you know the dense model to 16 experts, you get a huge boost. You still get a, a large improvement from 32 then to 64 then to 128, but it definitely does diminish. So there is some kind of sweet spot of these models, and it's not you know the best thing, as I'll also go into later for our 1.6 trillion parameter model to just scale indefinitely the number of experts. You really want to be like mixing in, making the flops per token larger, in addition to increasing the parameters by having some amount of experts. And here we're actually comparing um, now on training time where all models are given the same amount of like TPU hours or like the same amount of TPU and we look at the, the total training time on the X axis. Yeah, so we can see that for like, you know, getting a fixed like pre-training perplexity, a sparse model can get there, you know, seven times faster than the dense model at the scale. So yeah, you're, we're getting pretty like, you know, huge improvements on these like Pareto frontiers with these sparse models, which is really making us excited about them. And so what we're looking at here is, is like the, the test loss versus the number of model parameters. And the, there's a log scale on the X axis. And so we can see that, you know, yeah, we definitely start to, as we have like 64 experts, 128, 256, we do start to get diminishing returns. So yeah, but it is nice to see that for a while we were almost maybe potentially getting like close to a linear like scaling for the number of experts for decreasing the um, test loss. And so here, what we show is actually comparing, you know, so we have the T5 base model, which is the smallest model, which is the uh, green model. And we have T5 large, which is a large model. And it's actually so large that you actually need to be using model parallelism. And the idea with model parallelism is that, you know, if your all of your model parameters don't fit inside of a single core, then you need to partition it. And there's, you know, a lot of different ways people partition this. The standard way is to, you know, split the heads in self-attention in the self-attention layers across cores and also split this like internal feed forward layer in these like dense ReLU dense layers across cores. And so here we compare, you know, okay, if we take the T5 base, on one hand, let's try adding 64 experts. On the other hand, let's try, you know, roughly like doubling or like quadrupling the number of flops slash parameters. And so we can see that, you know, even when scaling up the, the dense model through the standard scaling by going to T5 large, that we're still getting much larger speed ups using um, switch base by just simply adding uh, sparsity to the, to the small model. Um, Barrett, can I ask something uh, about the uh, model parallelism here? Sure. Um, so can you give more um, details on this model parallelism? Are you doing pipelining or uh, there's also mesh tensor flow, which does uh, 2D partitioning on the model? Um, are you using any of those or, or this is something else? Yeah, so great question. I also go into this a bit uh, more later, but we use mesh tensor flow for all of these things. So we're not using like pipelining or anything okay. like that. It's basically like, yeah, all of these, every layer is being partitioned the same way across all cores. Um, okay. Yeah. So okay. we actually find this to be really effective in practice. So with pipelining, you have the downside that you get these bubbles and you need pretty high throughput by like breaking your batch into micro batches and mm -hmm. then sending a lot of them through the network. So this can be, this can have downsides because, you know, Typically, we find these deep learning models to not train super well at super huge batch sizes. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we're only using like a million batch size. And if you work out the math on this, like it's yeah, you can you can run into decently large pipeline bubbles if you're not using like really really large batches. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, in general, we're a big fan of the mesh TensorFlow style approach for these things. Like we think every code base should be using named axes and you're just partitioning everything based on like the semantics of the Einsum. So yeah, we, we really like using that. OK, OK, thank you. So one thing we also wanted to look at was, is switch transformer still effective at small scale? So yeah, before I was going into having 16, 32, 64, so forth, so on um, experts. But you know, typically, the way we run these models is that we'll have um, one expert per core. 
So that means that if you have 32 experts, we're roughly expecting you to have 30 be trading on 32 cores in parallel and they're interconnected in a pretty fast way. So this can be, you know, kind of impractical, especially for a lot of people that don't have access to like a supercomputer or a big cluster. So we wanted to actually see how the models scale with just very few experts. So yeah, here we can see we compare just a dense model to only having two, four, or eight experts. So yeah, so two experts is pretty nice because that means like maybe you're just running with one of the new GPU chips that has like, you know, two cores per chip or something like that. So, and we, we do see we get some pretty solid improvements, especially going from like for like up to four and eight experts. So yeah, we do think that these models can just be generally applicable, even if you don't have, um, you know, if you're not training a model on a lot of cores at once. Yeah, so next I'm gonna be talking about like how we really think about scaling and partitioning these models, especially in the context of model and data parallelism. And let me just do like a little bit of a recap and also feel free to, you know, ask any questions about this. But yeah, our philosophy is the following. So most people are training these models with data parallelism and that works great for expert models. That essentially allows us to be like, okay, if you're training with data parallelism, usually a safe bet is to just have one expert per data parallelism core. Um, and also we go into here, how to combine both data model and expert parallelism together when experts become too large to fit onto a single core. Yeah, so again, you know, increasing the parameters only while maintaining a fixed computation budget, like eventually yields diminishing returns for very sparse models. So yes, yeah, scaling only along the sparse domain doesn't work. And we also need to be increasing the flops per model to be able to get the best performing models. Um, yeah, so here we're going to see like how we can kind of do all of these jointly, because as we increase the flops, the expert layers will also become so large that again, they won't fit onto a single like processor anymore. Yeah, so here, here's like an illustration we have showing how across five different parallelism strategies, how the model weights, aka the first row, and then how the data, the, the second row are split across cores. And uh, yeah, so let me explain what all of this means. So maybe we can start in the data parallelism column. So what? So the idea with this is that there's going to be um, 16 cores total, which is represented by each of the white uh, squares. And we see that like the um, like each of these blue like small blue squares in here represents um, having the same model weights per core. So that means that every core is going to have the same exact model weights. And below for data parallelism, this is representing that there's one huge batch of data that's being partitioned across all of the data parallelism cores. Then for model parallelism, we can see that the opposite thing is happening. But in this model parallelism example, this is actually never done in practice because people always combine model and data parallelism together, which is the, the center column. But here we can see that, you know, there's one for the model parallelism, how the model weights are split. There's one giant set of model weights that are being split across all 16 cores. And then the opposite for how the data is split, where there's the same data replicated across every single core. And for the model and data parallelism, we see the um, we see a combination of this, where the model weights are so large that they'll be split across four cores, and then there'll be four different batches of, of data across all 16 cores. And then we can you know see how this can be combined with um, experts. So for the expert and data parallelism, we can see that again, the data is being split across all cores as this giant um, matrix. But instead of in the data parallelism example, you have the same weights per core. Now you actually are able to have unique weights per core. And you know it's kind of analogous on the farthest right column. Like again, some of this is a bit complicated to go into, but to highlight it again, it's like, yeah, we wanna be able to design a parallelism scheme such that when the experts also need to be partitioned across cores, it can also work well. And that's what we actually find to be our best performing solution. Um, I, I have a question regarding splitting the data. So to what extent mm -hmm. to what extent do you split your data? So is it like on batch axis or or even on token axis? Yeah, so it's just always on the batch axis. So typically the way we have like the tensor shapes of these things are going to be like like like, um, like number of sequences by sequence length by some model dimension. That's like the activation tensor getting passed around. And we always split on number of sequences. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so now I'm gonna talk about how we kind of designed our, or ended up designing our 1.6 trillion parameter model that actually ended up not 
necessarily performing super well. But yes, yeah, so let me go into this here. So in this work, we, we studied three models at the largest scale. So one of which was T5 XXL. This was the largest model in the T5 paper. And it was a dense model with 13 billion parameters. And all of these models are encoder decoder models where the idea is you have you know, an encoder which will like, you know, look at all tokens in a non-autoregressive fashion and then the decoder, which will attend to the top of the encoder and then also autoregressively predict what it thinks should come after all of the encoded tokens. And so we, we designed two sparse models. So one of which is switch XXL, which has the same flops um, per sequence, AKA flops per token as the T5 XXL model. And yeah, so we can see that, you know, while it has the same flops, now it has, goes from 13 billion to around 400 billion parameters. And we also designed this model called switch C, which is significantly fewer flops. It's actually 10 X fewer flops in the T5 XXL model, but it has 1.6 trillion parameters. And we can see in the bottom row that we um, we have like a bunch of the different you know model dimensions, and we can see that the the real difference that switch C has so many more parameters than switch XXL is that instead of having sixty four experts, it has twenty forty eight. And the way that these actually come about is very natural because if you have a fixed topology of twenty forty eight cores, you need to have some allocated towards model parallelism and some allocated towards um, data parallelism, aka um, experts. So in this case, we actually used no model parallelism and just had all of the cores going towards data parallelism, which allows us to have 24 experts. Whereas in the upper case, we actually have 64 cores going for um, experts and then the rest going towards model parallelism. And so, yeah, we also look at the pre-training perplexities here of all three of these models. And we actually note like on a step basis that the switch XXL model outperforms all the other models by like a pretty decent margin. But when we compare this on the like kind of Pareto frontier with TPU hours, we actually find that the uh, switch C model that uses a lot of sparsity actually performs the best. So in terms of like, you know, TPU hours, we actually find that switch C performs much, much better. And yeah, so there's actually this really interesting hypothesis from one of our co-authors called named Nam Shazir. So he was thinking that, you know, most, uh, um, like his unsubstantiated theory is that parameters are good for knowledge and compute AKA flops is good for intelligence. And so we actually tried to test this a bit with these two models, because we essentially have two large sparse models, one of which has way fewer parameters, but way more flops. And the other one has, you know, 1.6 trillion parameters, but very, very few flops. So to test this, we try fine tuning it on two different downstream tasks. The first of which is super glue, which is kind of our reasoning task. And the second is trivia QA, which is our knowledge proxy or like our knowledge task. And so here we're plotting the switch versus dense model. And on the x-axis, we have the pre-training perplexity. And on the y-axis, we have the super glue score. And so here we can actually see something interesting that you know, for a given pre-training perplexity, the dense model fine tunes better on super glue. And this is actually most evident also in the upper right corner of this plot where a model with you know, worse perplexity is actually fine tuning much, much better. And a few points on the Y axis can, is really like a pretty huge difference. So yeah, so this is some very interesting property and it also kind of highlights that there's some potential issues with the pre-training perplexity metrics that don't always get surfaced until you're actually fine tuning models on different tasks. So yeah, again, to kind of summarize, we are seeing for like a fixed perplexity that the dense models are fine tuning better on super glue, which is our reasoning proxy than the, the sparse model. Next, we look at a knowledge task. So trivia QA is something where you're just, it gives you, you, you give it a question, it just has to output an answer. It's a very simple task. And it really is just, you know, testing how much you can just memorize stuff during pre-training. And on this, we're actually seeing that for a given perplexity, the sparse models are doing, you know, significantly better, especially in the upper regime. So we can see that, you know, in the, for a perplexity of around like 1.1, you know, one, the sparse model, you know, is getting significantly better performance than its, its counterpart. So kind of the opposite behavior we saw before. And yeah, we thought this was very interesting, especially given that we really thought that the pre-training metric should really correlate well with a lot of the fine tuning tasks, but especially as you change model classes, yeah, we found that this can really break down. 
Interestingly, we also overlay our 1.6 trillion parameter model here. So we can see that it actually has you know, pretty good perplexity, but compared to the dense model with almost the same perplexity, it's fine tuning performance is worse, even much more worse than a lot of the other sparse models we trained, which definitely highlights the need for some combination of both flops and sparsity to obtain good fine tuning performance on a lot of different tasks. And we can again plot that same uh, red dot for the 1.6 trillion parameter model on our trivia QA task. And we see that it just does like hugely better on this trivia QA test. Like it just does really like completely off the, off the trend line. So yeah, it's definitely a very interesting new class of models that can have uh, very different behaviors depending on the type of task you give it. Yeah, and so next we actually wanted to study the fine tuning of sparse versus dense models on like a lot of different tasks. So here we study it on 11 different tasks ranging from like, yeah, reasoning, question answering, summarization, uh, yeah, a bunch of different tasks like this. And we try two different model scales. So we try base and then we also try um, large. And just, you know, as at a high level, we basically see that, yeah, the sparse models improve over the dense models in virtually all fine tuning tasks besides the two arc challenges. We also wanted to study the models in the context of multilingual training because there we thought it really had a natural interpretation of where experts could potentially specialize across languages. And when we ran it, we actually noticed something interesting. So one of which is we got good speed ups, but we actually got worse speed ups than in the monolingual case. So actually the expert models were performing worse in the monolingual case or worse in the multilingual case compared to the monolingual case. Whereas our, you know, our base model only got a 4x speed up as opposed to a 7x speed up for um, the monolingual English model. And finally, one thing we wanted to look at was, can we effectively distill the performance from these sparse models back into, the, back into dense models? So this is really useful, especially since sparse models have so many more parameters, which means you need more processors to potentially serve them. And yeah, this can just be very problematic. I think sparsity is really good. It can also be really good for inference when you have high throughput or high batch inference. But if you have you know, really low throughput, these models are not gonna be very good. And just more fundamentally, if you really care about having the best model per parameter, sparse models will never be the best. Like dense models on a per parameter basis will always outperform their sparse counterparts. So one of the, you know, if for the applications where people care about, like I want the best model that fits onto only four processors, then we try to just basically distill the sparse models back down into dense models. And so here we look at actually pre-training, like distilling the model during pre-training. And we just compare the T5 base versus a switch base. Both of these models trained from scratch. And we can see that the sparse model has roughly, you know, 10x the number of parameters than the dense model. And, you know, we, we try a few diff different distillation techniques, which aren't super important here. But, but we find something very interesting is that so look at the performance between the switch versus the dense model. And you can essentially distill a sparse model back down to the dense model and keep 30% of the performance improvements of the sparse model. So this is pretty promising. This definitely means that it's a, it's a reasonable strategy that even if you wanna eventually serve a dense model or use a dense model for something, that you can first pre-train a sparse model and then distill it back into a dense model. And again, we tried this in the context of a few different sparse models with varying number of parameters. And we do see like, you know, yeah, you can roughly maintain between maybe like 35 to 28% of the performance improvements of the sparse model when distilling it back down to a dense ones while being effectively able to, you know, get rid of like 99% of the parameters in some cases, which is pretty interesting. So those were both looking at, you know, distilling it onto a pre-training task. So now we also look at distilling it into a fine tuning task. So the idea would be is like, if you wanna get a dense model that does well on super glue, you first fine tune your sparse model on super glue and then distill it into a dense model on super glue. And interestingly, we find that, yeah, you roughly maintain, you know, the similar performance improvement, which is around 30%. So even across super glue and the pre-training task, yeah, like there seems to be something kind of magical about the 30% number. It's like, yeah, you can distill the sparse model down to its dense counterpart and maintain about 30% of the performance improvements. Yeah, and just to wrap up, so, you know, switch transformer, it simplifies and improves over mixture of expert models. 
And you know, we see really large speed ups using the same amount of compute over its dense counterpart uh, T5 models. We can you know, shrink models up to 99% in terms of parameters while preserving you know, roughly 30% of the quality gains. We present some improved pre-training and fine-tuning techniques for sparse models. And we also find that they work well, although not as well on multilingual data. And we show that you can you know, combine data model and expert parallelism to create uh, models that you know, have up to 1.6 trillion parameters. And lastly, one thing I wanted to highlight was some work actually using these sparse models, not only for language, but for computer vision as well. And yeah, so all of this is gonna be on image classification. And yeah, we can see like these similar plots on the right, similar things to what we were showing as well, where basically we're looking at the total compute budget and then seeing that, you know, sparse models compared to their dense counterparts are working pretty well as well. And all of these sparse, sparse layers are actually inserted in these uh, VIT networks, which is actually very nice because then it has like a, nat there's a natural interpretation for tokens and stuff. So a lot of the same algorithms and things like that can be used. One really interesting idea that these that this work proposed was actually using um, capacity factors less than one. So before I talked about like this capacity factor buffer where we would always have it greater than one, but actually this work actually decreases at less than one. And this has some really nice properties where then you're kind of doing some type of adaptive computation where a capacity factor of 0.5 means that, yeah, I only actually wanna process half the tokens in the sparse layer. So you kind of look at it globally. You'll be like, okay, I'm gonna look at all of the tokens in this case, like image patches, and I'm only gonna you know, apply expert computation on like 0.5 or 0.3% of them. And they actually get really nice, you know, performance speed trade-offs using this technique, which is I think really nice. Cause I think, you know, one motivation for sparsity is that, yeah, it kind of makes sense from an intuitive level that yeah, maybe each input, we don't want to apply the same weights. But I also think it makes sense that yeah, for each input, we probably don't want to apply the same weights and we don't want to apply the same amount of compute. And this, this work takes like a really nice step in that direction. Um, and we've also, you know, experimented with this on language as well and, and find that it can also work well. So yeah, uh, thank you. That's the, that's the talk. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, uh, actually, I, I would like to open with a question. Uh, I thought of an experiment when you showed uh, the distillation results. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, uh, if we trained uh, a smaller model for uh, like, uh, let, let's say we have five, five experts for five times the number of steps, would we get a similar performance to the distilled model? Like a model- Sorry, could you- Yeah. Oh, sorry, could you, I, I don't think I fully understood. Could you, would you mind explaining that again? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so, so basically our, uh, our distilled model here uh, is, is a smaller model, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but they, it is like uh, during training, um, we, we may assume somehow that if it has, it has uh, like it had seen more, more training samples in a smaller batch manner, uh, mm -hmm. right? So, so if we, if we well, let's do this experiment, let's take a, this uh, smaller mo model and train it from scratch, uh, but for uh, like for, for, for iteration or for uh, like X number of iteration, which X is the number of experts. Uh, did I explain that well? I'm not sure. Yeah, so maybe let me give you an answer and let me see if this kind of uh, satisfies your, your question. So, so first of which is like for superglue, for example, like all the models are always trained to convergence. So there's no question on like, you know, if you train the model longer, will it perform better? So are you saying that basically since like we first train a sparse model and then distill it into a dense model, it's effectively a little bit unfair because that, that distilled model is getting many more training steps? Uh, no, no. Um, I mean, uh, I, I wasn't talking about the, like the distillation isn't done directly on superglue, right? It is in this case. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, I, uh, I withdraw my point. So uh, do uh, our audience have any questions? Um, I have a quick question about the expert parallelism. So we are, um, mm -hmm. uh, the mesh TensorFlow is available open source and we are using it. Thank you for that. Uh, how can we find the implementation of this um, expert parallelism? Uh, sure. Yeah, if you send me, yeah, it's, it's in the code base. If you, if you send me an email, I'm happy to shoot you the exact oh. pointers to the open source okay. library of where all this exists mm -hmm. and how to use it. Thank you. 
That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Uh, you're using Mesh TensorFlow. Yeah, we love using Mesh TensorFlow. I think it's like a <laughs> great library. So we, we have four minutes uh, to left if we have any questions to Bart. So Bert, maybe I can ask a, like a detailed question. In terms of the training regime, did you observe a difference like with these quite big models, we uh, see this double descent phenomenon. Does the sparsity have an effect on that as well? Or Yeah, so basically, have you ever run into cases where making the model larger makes the performance worse? Mm -hmm. No, we, 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 we empirically never observed anything like this. Like typically, okay. as we make our models bigger, the performance just always gets better. So uh, like for, for us students who have access to like uh, at maximum eight GPUs, mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's a valid uh, like method to, to basically train eight models and then uh, distill them down or, or eight, eight, eight experts and distill them down? Yeah, I mean, I think even like using two or four experts could honestly be interesting. I'm sorry, I was just trying to find the slide of the expert scaling with the few number of experts. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's totally reasonable to just use two or four experts. I mean, let me ask you a question. Like when you're training models, do you just typically train with a single GPU or do you train with like two or four GPUs using data parallelism? Yeah, data I guess my- I, I use my uh, data parallelism. I guess my pitch is like, if you're using data parallelism, you might as well already use experts. Yeah, because it just fits so well with the parallelism strategy. So, like, if you're using data parallelism, you might as well just toss experts in there, because it's it's really yeah, it'll definitely be I think the Pareto optimal thing to do, especially if the GPUs are connected where you have like fast communication. Um, yeah, so that I guess that's my kind of pitch, but I'm also you know a bit biased, so you should at least empirically try it. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I uh, I mean, yeah. but if we if we find a way to distill this down, not on uh, like directly on a task, but maybe on on the language modeling objective. Uh, that, that's why yeah. I asked the first question. Oh, yeah, so we, yes, yes, okay. So we also did distillation both on superglue and then on the pre-training objective. Um, and we also found it to be effective on the pre-training objective. Yes, and more so than just training the one model for longer, like, like you kind of mentioned, to make sure it's like a fair comparison. Um, so yeah, it does seem still effective. But I guess when you're using these models too for fine tuning, are you also using data parallelism for fine tuning? Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, the okay. model needs to be very big. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, you can also use the experts then without you know splitting them across cores too on like a single core. So one thing like I didn't go into is like actually how to design the expert models, like how to set the layer frequency and stuff. And typically the, the reason we'll insert experts one every four layers is because yeah, then we can actually shrink the topology such that we maybe have two experts per core or four experts per core from like a memory standpoint. So that's another strategy. You just have the expert layers less frequently. And then when you're you know, going from two GPUs to a single GPU, actually all the stuff just fits into a single GPU anyway. I see, thank you. Um... Um, I, I think there is a question from Bilal. He is saying, which sectors will this project affect the future of? So, so the, the question is, uh, what what sectors uh, or or yeah, what 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 sectors will be affected by this project in the future? When you say sectors, you mean like research areas, or you mean like products, or um, I guess I can just comment on everything like at a high level first, like I think across all domains, these models are pretty useful. Like as I kind of presented some results before, they're now, these models are being used in the context of computer vision as well. Um, yeah, I think basically any place where people are training models across multiple cores, like experts can make sense. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty optimistic that these models are gonna become quite popular, especially for the, the larger scale models being trained um, across all different domains, whether it's, you know, language, speech, vision, um, so forth, so on. 
uh, but I, I think you know, in order for people to or for researchers to adopt it, um, it needs to be done in in a like in a small scale compared to mm -hmm. this billion parameters, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think you know even having as few as four experts, for example, you get benefits and stuff. So even at a small scale, I think this can uh, still be effective and people will use it. Okay, thanks. Um, so I, I think we can end our seminar if we have no other questions. Thanks, Barrett, for uh, waking up for early for us. Oh, yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure to give the talk. Thank you very much. It Thank you very much. Very thanks insightful. Much, Barrett. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, feel free to send me any emails or questions about also mesh TensorFlow related stuff. I'm always happy to, you know, answer I'm any already, questions. I'm already composing the email. <laughs> you, you have <laughs> okay, it in awesome. few minutes. <laughs> Great. Okay, sounds good. I'll be on the lookout for it. Okay. Thanks, Thank Bye, everyone. Awesome. Bye. Thank you.